Hi everyone, my name is Dr Matt Williams. I'm a tutor in politics and what is known as the Access Fellow here at Jesus College at the University of Oxford. Now, how did I get here? How did I get into the position of being a tutor at an Oxford college? Well, I came top in every year of my undergraduate studies at the University of Bristol. Now, I found that quite difficult to say because I'm not the sort of person that likes to show off. I tend to be quite sort of shy about that sort of stuff. But I wanted to share it because I worked my little socks off working out all of these little tricks as to how to do really well at university because I'm not a genius, right? Definitely not. <laughs> so I worked out that actually doing really well at university is about the choices you make. It's not about destiny. And I teach my students those sorts of choices. And I figured, well, why not just post it on the internet and see what happens? <laughs> so hopefully these will be useful, but let me know in the comments what you think about them. So there are five tips that I think are particularly helpful and summarize the sorts of things that I went through as I was studying at university. So let's start with tip number one, which is that you've got to work out your motivation. You've got to know why you want to do really well, why you want to get a sort of a, an award class, award winning first class degree at a British university or a, you know, a flawless GPA at a US university and so on. Why are you doing that? In my case, I was doing it because I desperately wanted to prove Cambridge wrong. <laughs> Cambridge had rejected me as a 17 year old and I wasn't bitter, honest. Well, I was maybe a bit bitter and so I was trying to prove that they'd made a bit of a mistake. But also I just kind of wanted to prove it to myself. I just wanted to see if I could. Uh, so that was my initial motivation. But luckily, when I started looking into politics, which was the subject I was studying, I started really loving it and becoming sort of mildly obsessed with it. I would read all sorts of things that most other students wouldn't read. I would go to more lectures than was necessary. I would, you know, just immerse myself in pretty much everything. So having started with that sort of a motivation of revenge, <laughs> I ended up with a much more healthy motivation of this is kind of awesome. I love this subject. You know, I describe politics as like um, Love Island with nuclear weapons. For those watching outside the UK, Love Island is sort of tawdry soap opera where people go onto an island and, and fall in love. Uh, and it's just a psychodrama. Uh, so politics is just this sort of re repulsive soap opera and I can't take my eyes off it. So that's you know, my primary motivation now, but init my initial motivation was uh, sort of showing gamers <laughs> that they'd made a mistake. But you've got to work out what's going to motivate you. You might be motivated by the sort of doors that could be open for you if you do particularly well as an undergraduate student, of which, which are pretty considerable. You know, the difference between a decent degree and an, an outstanding degree can be absolutely fundamental with regards to the labour market. So have a think about what motivates you. Also have a think about what demotivates you, right? Why is it that you might be tempted to roll over in bed when the alarm goes off rather than go to another lecture or read another book? It could be because you're not necessarily looking after the basics. You might not be uh, very well slept, right? You might be sort of uh, sleep deprived. You might be malnourished in the sense that you're not eating a balanced diet. You might be dehydrated. Those three things were definitely true of me in my first year of university. And indeed, it's quite common for students. And it was only when I started really looking after those things that my results really improved massively because my motivation transformed. So tip number one, think about your motivation. Again, okay, fairly obvious, I suppose. Tip number two is you've got to work out what the examiners want from you, right? These are the people who are ultimately in control of what grade you will get. So you need to attend lectures and seminars and tutorials and all of that good stuff. Now this is pretty obvious, right? But the examiners will also, these days, more likely than they did even in my day, publish assessment criteria, usually in an accessible place like online. Uh, and if you ask them, they will show you, hopefully, <laughs> what assessment criteria they use. In other words, the mark schemes that they use. And they will be able to describe what it takes to go from a good mark to a really good mark. And you have a right to know that, right? If you're studying at a university, it shouldn't be a mystery. It shouldn't just feel like some sort of bizarre accident that some people get certain grades and others other grades, right? So go and talk to your examiners and go and find out what do you want from me? And that will be very helpful for you, I'm sure. Tip number three is that you should prepare for setbacks. In your sort of route to success at university, you have to try some things out. And sometimes when you try things out, they're just not gonna work for a number of reasons. But if you're too cautious and you don't try pushing boundaries, then you're not likely to get the top marks. 
So you've got to sort of be ready for a few setbacks, a few failures even. Uh, that was certainly the case with me. So on my path through Bristol University, I never used to get 2-1 grades. So that, those are grades between 60 and 69. Um, I used to only get firsts or two twos or, or fails. <laughs> so my, my, my spread was massive. And that was because I was trying very ambitious things in all of my essays, right? Every essay was an opportunity to try something really bold, really sort of innovative. And sometimes that worked and sometimes it didn't. <laughs> Thankfully, by my third year, I had to sort of squash that to, to consistently just getting firsts. But you've got to try out a few things. You've got to uh, prepare for a few setbacks and that's okay. That's not because you're doing anything wrong. You know, if anything, trying to be more creative, more innovative, innovative thinker is bound to lead to a few setbacks along the way and that's okay. You know, um, Evander Holyfield is the only boxer, I think, in history, correct me if I'm wrong on this, uh, who became champion in multiple weight classes without ever losing a fight. He lost his first fights after he was champion of the world. <laughs> now, that's therefore incredibly unusual. And also his biography must be slightly dull, at least the boxing part of it, because all it would say is, I just won a lot of times. <laughs> I was a really good boxer. Whereas, you know, most people, when they are reaching the pinnacle of any sort of profession, they have to take a few setbacks. And if, if anything, that makes them way stronger. So don't be scared of setbacks and don't sort of hold back from trying some creative things just because you're scared of failure. My fourth tip is that you need some plans, right? You've got to work out where are you headed and how are you going to get there? So if you're trying to get a first class, let's say, or a, a 4.0 GPA in a particular paper, then sort of break down what steps you're going to have to take in order to achieve that. What, what exams do you have to take? What coursework do you have to submit? How are you going to give yourself sufficient time to do the work in order to perform well in those things? Again, this sounds kind of obvious, but if you are disciplined and regimented, it makes an enormous difference. I think sometimes people suspect that to be brilliant, you've got to be sort of slightly chaotic and live life uh, one second at a time. And sure, some people can do that, but for people who, aren't, who don't necessarily think of themselves as natural born geniuses like me, <laughs> I've got to have a plan, right? I've got to work out what am I doing? How am I going to get there? What help do I need? Who do I need to talk to? And all of that sort of stuff. So making yourself some plans and making it all bite-sized, that's crucial. Now, my fifth tip is that you've got to stand out a bit. Now, this is because, I mean, at least at British universities, and certainly for essay-based subjects like politics, like humanities, social sciences, law, that sort of stuff, you have to be clearly demonstrating your contribution to debates. But even in STEM subjects, maths, physics, biology and so on, it would still be important to demonstrate that you are capable of thinking critically for yourself. Let's say you had a, a, a proof to solve in mathematics, demonstrating that you can think of a way of solving that proof for yourself, utilizing all of the skills you've developed would be very important. And ultimately, you know, standing out is about showing off a little bit. It's about flexing, to use that term, which makes me sound really old when I say it. <laughs> it's about sort of showing what you're capable of. So an analogy I tend to use with my students here in Oxford is that it's a bit like being on the Great British Bake Off. The bakers that tend to do really well on that are the ones that use slightly wacky ingredients. They use things that most people wouldn't expect in a cake, like sort of courgette or I don't know, you, you can think of some other examples. You know, they're, because they're deliberately trying to show off their skills. They're trying to show that they are innovative bakers, that they can do things that push boundaries. And that's really important. And there's a relatively straightforward trick that I applied when I was studying, which was that I would always pick the hardest questions, always. And I would always pick a line of argument for each of those questions, which I thought counted most people's intuitions. So I was being a bit of a contrarian. I would try and come up with ideas and arguments that I thought most people wouldn't be willing to even go for. And I was doing so in questions that I knew almost no one else would want to answer. So I was deliberately making my life difficult in order to show off my skills. And it didn't really matter whether I believed in what I was saying, because that's not what you're being judged on. You're being judged on your skills and how well you present those. You're not being judged on your, your beliefs, right? So I would just sort of work almost like a mercenary lawyer. <laughs> I would say this question is 
really hard and this line of argument for this question is even harder so it's going to show off tons of skills it's going to show off my critical thinking it's going to show off my originality it's going to show off my you know ability to deal with evidence and all this sort of stuff that the examiners are looking for to a much higher degree it'll also just be much more engaging for the examiners you know they would have read through a pile of scripts you know and now i am an examiner i know what it's like you read through hundreds and hundreds of essays and they're all basically saying the same thing and then one brave soul first of all answers a question that no other one no one else is answering and they do so in a really surprising manner now what i'm not saying here is that you need to sort of say something that's completely indefensibly mad right you don't need to start sort of pretending that the earth is flat or coming up with something that could be sort of actually quite unpleasant or slanderous right you don't want to do do that but nonetheless you need to have a good sense of what has been said before and how you can say something a bit different and to you know to give you an example i wrote an essay that the highest mark i got for an essay at university was was 80 and that was for an essay about U european union foreign policy and the question was about its success and I decided to define success a certain way which I knew the rest of the literature hadn't done and I could show I could say look the literature don't define success this way but I think it should be defined this way and given that I would say that the, the EU's foreign policy has been wildly successful which basically no one was saying in those days <laughs> so I was sort of deliberately sort of being a little bit of a contrarian a bit sort of out there but in a defensible way and I could show look here's where I've got this from the literature you know I'm not just being I'm not just going out on a limb I'm not just being completely bonkers I'm saying something that can be defended but not many people are willing to defend it and it just showed off so many skills and so many, so often my students say but I don't know what I think about these things who cares what you think about these things right you're not going to take a lie detector test you're not going to be told to stand by your convictions on any of these matters so argue what you can argue and show off your skills. That's the goal in an exam. So those were my five tips. Hopefully they make sense. If you have any questions or comments, do let me know in the comments below. Um, but in the meantime, best of luck in your studies and I hope to meet you one day. Thanks so much for watching. Bye now.